Sri Yukteswar's wisdom was so penetrating that, heedless of remarks, he often replied to one's unspoken observation. What a person imagines he hears, and what the speaker has really implied, may be poles apart, he said. Try to feel the thoughts behind the confusion of main's verbiage. But divine insight is painful to worldly ears, master was not popular with superficial students. The wise, always few in number, deeply revered him. I dare say Sri Yukteswar would have been the most sought after guru in India had his words not been so candid and so censorious. I am hard on those who come for my training, he admitted to me. That is my way, take it or leave it. I will never compromise. But you will be much kinder to your disciples, that is your way. I try to purify only in the fires of severity, searing beyond the average toleration. The gentle approach of love is also transfiguring. The inflexible and the yielding methods are equally effective if applied with wisdom. You will go to foreign lands, where blunt assaults on the ego are not appreciated. A teacher could not spread India's message in the West without an ample fund of accommodative patience and forbearance. I refuse to state the amount of truth I later came to find in Master's words. Though Sri Yukteswar's undissembling speech prevented a large following during his years on earth, nevertheless his living spirit manifests today over the world through sincere students of his Kriya Yoga and other teachings. He has further dominion in main souls than ever Alexander dreamed of in the soil. Father arrived one day to pay his respects to Sri Yukteswar. My parent expected, very lightly, to hear some words in my praise. He was shocked to be given a long account of my imperfections. It was master's practice to recount simple, negligible shortcomings with an air of portentous gravity. Father rushed to see me. From your guru's remarks I thought to find you a complete wreck. My parent was between tears and laughter. The only cause of Sri Yukteswar's displeasure at the time was that I had been trying, against his gentle hint, to convert a certain man to the spiritual path. With indignant speed I sought out my guru. He received me with downcast eyes, as though conscious of guilt. It was the only time I ever saw the divine line meek before me. The unique moment was savored to the full. Sir, why did you judge me so mercilessly before my astounded father? Was that just? I will not do it again. Master's tone was apologetic. Instantly I was disarmed. How readily the great man admitted his fault. Though he never again upset father's peace of mind, master relentlessly continued to dissect me whenever and wherever he chose. New disciples often joined Sri Yukteswar in exhaustive criticism of others. Wise like the Guru. Models of flawless discrimination. But he who takes the offensive must not be defenseless. The same carping students fled precipitantly as soon as master publicly unloosed in their direction a few shafts from his analytical quiver. Tender inner weaknesses, revolting at mild touches of censure, are like diseased parts of the body, recalling before even delicate handling. This was Sri Yukteswar's amused comment on the flighty ones. There are disciples who seek a guru made in their own image. Such students often complained that they did not understand Sri Yukteswar. Neither do you comprehend God. I retorted on one occasion. When a saint is clear to you, you will be one. Among the trillion mysteries, breathing every second the inexplicable air, who may venture to ask that the fathomless nature of a master be instantly grasped? Students came, and generally went. Those who craved a path of early sympathy and comfortable recognitions did not find it at the hermitage. Master offered shelter and shepherding for the aeons, but many disciples miserly demanded ego balm as well. They departed, preferring life's countless humiliations before any humility. Master's blazing rays, the open penetrating sunshine of his wisdom, were too powerful for their spiritual sickness. They sought some lesser teacher who, shading them with flattery, permitted the fitful sleep of ignorance. During my early months with Master, 
I had experienced a sensitive fear of his reprimands. These were reserved, I soon saw, for disciples who had asked for his verbal vivisection. If any writhing student made a protest, Sri Yukteswar would become unoffendedly silent. His words were never wrathful, but impersonal with wisdom. Master's insight was not for the unprepared ears of casual visitors, he seldom remarked on their defects, even if conspicuous. But towards students who sought his counsel, Sri Yukteswar felt a serious responsibility. Brave indeed is the guru who undertakes to transform the crude ore of ego-permeated humanity. A saint's courage roots in his compassion for the stumbling eyeless of this world. When I had abandoned underlying resentment, I found a marked decrease in my chastisement. In a very subtle way, master melted into comparative clemency. In time I demolished every wall of rationalization and subconscious reservation behind which the human personality generally shields itself. The reward was an effortless harmony with my guru. I discovered him then to be trusting, considerate, and silently loving. Undemonstrative, however, he bestowed no word of affection. My own temperament is principally devotional. It was disconcerting at first to find that my guru, saturated with janana but seemingly dry of bhakti, expressed himself only in terms of cold spiritual mathematics. But as I tuned myself to his nature, I discovered no diminution but rather increase in my devotional approach to God. A self-realized master is fully able to guide his various disciples along natural lines of their essential bias. My relationship with Sri Yukteswar, somewhat inarticulate, nonetheless poses all eloquence. Often I found his silent signature on my thoughts, rendering speech inutile. Quietly sitting beside him, I felt his bounty pouring peacefully over my being. Sri Yukteswar's impartial justice was notably demonstrated during the summer vacation of my first college year. I welcomed the opportunity to spend uninterrupted months at Serampore with my guru. You may be in charge of the hermitage. Master was pleased over my enthusiastic arrival. Your duties will be the reception of guests and supervision of the work of the other disciples. Kumar, a young villager from East Bengal, was accepted a fortnight later for hermitage training. Remarkably intelligent, he quickly won Sri Yukteswar's affection. For some unfathomable reason, Master was very lenient to the new resident. Mukunda, let Kumar assume your duties. Employ your own time in sweeping and cooking. Master issued these instructions after the new boy had been with us for a month. Exalted to leadership, Kumar exercised a petty household tyranny. In silent mutiny, the other disciples continued to seek me out for daily counsel. Mukunda is impossible. You made me supervisor, yet the others go to him and obey him. Three weeks later Kumar was complaining to our guru. I overheard him from an adjoining room. That's why I assigned him to the kitchen and you to the parlor. Sri Yukteswar's withering tones were new to Kumar. In this way you have come to realize that a worthy leader has the desire to serve and not to dominate. You wanted Mugunda's position but could not maintain it by merit. Return now to your earlier work as cook's assistant. After this humbling incident, Master resumed toward Kumar a former attitude of unwanted indulgence. Who can solve the mystery of attraction? In Kumar our Guru discovered a charming fount which did not spurt for the fellow disciples. Though the new boy was obviously Sri Yukteswar's favorite, I felt no dismay. Personal idiosyncrasies, possessed even by Masters, lend a rich complexity to the pattern of life. My nature is seldom commandeered by a detail, I was seeking from Sri Yukteswar a more inaccessible benefit than an outward praise. Kumar spoke venomously to me one day without reason. I was deeply hurt. Your head is swelling to the bursting point. I added a warning whose truth I felt intuitively. Unless you mend your ways, someday you will be asked to leave this ashram. Laughing sarcastically, Kumar repeated my remark to our guru, who had just entered the room. 
fully expecting to be scolded i retired meekly to a corner maybe mukunda is right master's reply to the boy came with unusual coldness i escaped without castigation a year later kumar set out for a visit to his childhood home he ignored the quiet disapproval of shri yukteswar who never authoritatively controlled his disciples movements on the boy's return to serampore in a few months a change was unpleasantly apparent gone was the stately kumar with serenely glowing face only an undistinguished peasant stood before us one who had lately acquired a number of evil habits master summoned me and broken heartedly discussed the fact that the boy was now unsuited to the monastic hermitage life mukunda i will leave it to you to instruct kumar to leave the ashram tomorrow i can't do it tears stood in shri yukteswar's eyes but he controlled himself quickly the boy would never have fallen to these depths had he listened to me and not gone away to mix with undesirable companions he has rejected my protection the callous world must be his guru still kumar's departure brought me no elation sadly i wondered how one with power to win a master's love could ever respond to cheaper allures enjoyment of wine and sex are rooted in the natural man and require no delicacies of perception for their appreciation sense wise are comparable to the evergreen oleander fragrant with its multicolored flowers every part of the plant is poisonous The land of healing lies within, radiant with that happiness blindly sought in a thousand misdirections. Keen intelligence is to edged, Master once remarked in reference to Kumar's brilliant mind. It may be used constructively or destructively like a knife, either to cut the ball of ignorance or to decapitate one's self. Intelligence is rightly guided only after the mind has acknowledged the inescapability of spiritual law. My guru mixed freely with men and women disciples treating all as his children perceiving their soul equality he showed no distinction or partiality in sleep you do not know whether you are a man or a woman he said just as a man impersonating a woman does not become one so the soul impersonating both man and woman has no sex the soul is the pure changeless image of god Shri Yukteswar never avoided or blamed women as objects of seduction. Men, he said, were also a temptation to women. I once inquired of my guru why a great ancient saint had called women the door to hell. A girl must have proved very troublesome to his peace of mind in his early life, my guru answered caustically. Otherwise he would have denounced not women but some imperfection in his own self-control. If a visitor dared to relate a suggestive story in the hermitage, master would maintain an unresponsive silence. Do not allow yourself to be thrashed by the provoking whip of a beautiful face, he told the disciples. How can sense slaves enjoy the world? Its subtle flavors escape them while they grovel in primal mud. All nice discriminations are lost to the man of elemental lusts. Students seeking to escape from the dualistic maya delusion received from Sri Yukteswar patient an understanding counsel. Just as the purpose of eating is to satisfy hunger, not greed, so the sex instinct is designed for the propagation of the species according to natural law, never for the kindling of insatiable longings, he said. Destroy wrong desires now, otherwise they will follow you after the astral body is torn from its physical casing. even when the flesh is weak the mind should be constantly resistant if temptation assails you with cruel force overcome it by impersonal analysis and indomitable will every natural passion can be mastered conserve your powers be like the capacious ocean absorbing within all the tributary rivers of the senses small yearnings are openings in the reservoir of your inner peace permitting healing waters to be wasted in the desert soil of materialism the forceful activating impulse of wrong desire is the greatest enemy to the happiness of man roam in the world as a lion of self control see that the frogs of weakness don't kick you around the devotee is finally freed from all instinctive compulsions he transforms his need for human affection into aspiration for god alone 
a love solitary because on the present Shri Yukteswar's mother lived in the Rana Mahal district of Benares where I had first visited my guru Gracious and kindly she was yet a woman of very decided opinions I stood on her balcony one day and watched mother and son talking together In his quiet sensible way master was trying to convince her about something He was apparently unsuccessful for she shook her head with great vigor Nay nay my son go away now Your wise words are not for me I am not your disciple Shri Yukteswar backed away without further argument like a scolded child I was touched at his great respect for his mother even in her unreasonable moods She saw him only as her little boy not as a sage There was a charm about the trifling incident it supplied a side light on my guru's unusual nature inwardly humble and outwardly unbendable the monastic regulations do not allow a swami to retain connection with worldly ties after their formal severance he cannot perform the ceremonial family rites which are obligatory on the householder yet shankara the ancient founder of the swami order disregarded the injunctions at the death of his beloved mother he cremated her body with heavenly fire which he caused to spurt from his appraised hand shri yukteswar also ignored the restrictions in a fashion less spectacular when his mother passed on he arranged the crematory services by the holy ganges in benares and fed many brahmans in conformance with age old custom the shastric prohibitions were intended to help swamis overcome narrow identifications Shankara and Shri Yukteswar had wholly merged their beings in the impersonal spirit. They needed no rescue by rule. Sometimes, too, a master purposely ignores a canon in order to uphold its principle as superior to and independent of form. Thus Jesus plucked ears of corn on the day of rest. To the inevitable critics he said, the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath. Outside of the scriptures seldom was a book honored by Shri Yukteswar's perusal yet he was invariably acquainted with the latest scientific discoveries and other advancements of knowledge a brilliant conversationalist he enjoyed an exchange of views on countless topics with his guests my guru's ready wit and rollicking laugh enlivened every discussion often grave master was never gloomy To seek the Lord one need not disfigure his face he would remark Remember that finding God will mean the funeral of all sorrows Among the philosophers professors lawyers and scientists who came to the hermitage a number arrived for their first visit with the expectation of meeting an orthodox religionist A supercilious smile or a glance of amused tolerance occasionally betrayed that the newcomers anticipated nothing more than a few pious platitudes Yet their reluctant departure would bring an expressed conviction that Shri Yukteswar had shown precise insight into their specialized fields. My guru ordinarily was gentle and affable to guests. His welcome was given with charming cordiality. Yet inveterate egotists sometimes suffered an invigorating shock. They confronted in master either a frigid indifference or a formidable opposition, ice or iron. A noted chemist once crossed swords with Sri Yukteswar. The visitor would not admit the existence of God, inasmuch as science has devised no means of detecting him. So you have inexplicably failed to isolate the supreme power in your test tubes. Master's gaze was stern. I recommend an unheard of experiment. Examine your thoughts unremittingly for 24 hours. then wonder no longer at god's absence a celebrated pandit received a similar jolt with ostentatious zeal the scholar shook the ashram rafters with scriptural law resounding passages poured from the mahabharata the upanishads 12 to 21 the bhasis 12 to 22 of shankara i am waiting to hear you shri yukteswar's tone was inquiring as though utter silence had reigned The pundit was puzzled. Quotations there have been in superabundance. Master's words conversed me with mirth as I squatted in my corner at a respectful distance from the visitor. 
But what original commentary can you supply from the uniqueness of your particular life? What holy text have you absorbed and made your own? In what ways have these timeless truths renovated your nature? Are you content to be a hollow vitrola, mechanically repeating the words of other men? I give up. The scholar's chagrin was comical. I have no inner realization. For the first time, perhaps, he understood that discerning placement of the comma does not atone for a spiritual comma. These bloodless pedants smell unduly of the lamp. My guru remarked after the departure of the chastened one. They prefer philosophy to be a gentle intellectual setting up exercise. Their elevated thoughts are carefully unrelated either to the crudity of outward action or to any scourging inner discipline. Master stressed on other occasion the futility of mere book learning. Do not confuse understanding with a larger vocabulary, he remarked. Sacred writings are beneficial in stimulating desire for inward realization, if one stanza at a time is slowly assimilated. Continual intellectual study results in vanity and the false satisfaction of an undigested knowledge. Sri Yukteswar related one of his own experiences in scriptural edification. The scene was a forest hermitage in eastern Bengal, where he observed the procedure of a renowned teacher, the Blue Balav. His method, at once simple and difficult, was common in ancient India. Dabru Balav had gathered his disciples around him in the sylvan solitudes. The holy Bhagavad Gita was open before them. Steadfastly they looked at one passage for half an hour, then closed their eyes. Another half hour slipped away. The master gave a brief comment. Motionless, they meditated again for an hour. Finally, the Guru spoke. Have you understood? Yes, sir. One in the group ventured this assertion. No, not fully. Seek the spiritual vitality that has given these words the power to rejuvenate India century after century. Another are disappeared in silence. The master dismissed the students and turned to Sri Yukteswar. Do you know the Bhagavad Gita? No, sir, not really, though my eyes and mind have run through its pages many times. Thousands have replied to me differently. The great sage smiled at master in blessing. If one busies himself with an outer display of scriptural will, what time is left for silent inward diving after the priceless pearls? Sri Yukteswar directed the study of his own disciples by the same intensive method of one-pointedness. Wisdom is not assimilated with the eyes, but with the atoms, he said. When your conviction of a truth is not merely in your brain but in your being, you may diffidently vouch for its meaning. He discouraged any tendency a student might have to construe book knowledge as a necessary step to spiritual realization. The Rishis wrote in one sentence profundities that commentating scholars busy themselves over for generations, he remarked. Endless literary controversy is for sluggard minds. What more liberating thought than God is nay, God. But man does not easily return to simplicity. It is seldom God for him, but rather learned pomposities. His ego is pleased that he can grasp such erudition. Men who were pridefully conscious of high worldly position were likely, in master's presence, to add humility to their other possessions. A local magistrate once arrived for an interview at the seaside hermitage in Puri. The man, who held a reputation for ruthlessness, had it well within his power to oust us from the ashram. I cautioned my guru about the despotic possibilities. But he seated himself with an uncompromising air and did not rise to greet the visitor. Slightly nervous, I squatted near the door. The man had to content himself with a wooden box. My guru did not request me to fetch a chair. There was no fulfillment of the magistrate's obvious expectation that his importance would be ceremoniously acknowledged. A metaphysical discussion ensued. The guest blundered through misinterpretations of the scriptures. As his accuracy sunk, his ire rose. Do you know that I stood first in the M.A. examination? Reason had forsaken him, but he could still shout. Mr. Magistrate, 
You forget that this is not your courtroom, Master replied evenly. From your childish remarks, I would have surmised that your college career was unremarkable. A university degree, in any case, is not remotely related to Vedic realization. Saints are not produced in batches every semester like accountants. After a stunned silence, the visitor laughed heartily. This is my first encounter with the heavenly magistrate, he said. Later he made a formal request, couched in the legal terms which were evidently part and parcel of his being, to be accepted as a probationary disciple. My guru personally attended to the details connected with the management of his property. Unscrupulous persons on various occasions attempted to secure possession of master's ancestral land. With determination and even by instigating lawsuits, Sri Yukteswar outwitted every opponent. He underwent these painful experiences from a desire never to be a begging guru or a burden on his disciples. His financial independence was one reason why my alarmingly outspoken master was innocent of the cunnings of diplomacy. Unlike those teachers who have to flatter their supporters, my guru was impervious to the influences, open or subtle, of others' wealth. Never did I hear him ask or even hint for money for any purpose. His hermitish training was given free and freely to all disciples. An insolent court deputy arrived one day at the Serampore ashram to serve Sri Yukteswar with a legal summons. A disciple named Kanai and myself were also present. The officer's attitude toward master was offensive. It will do you good to leave the shadows of your hermitage and breathe the honest air of a courtroom. The deputy grinned contemptuously. I could not contain myself. Another word of your impudence and you will be on the floor. I advanced threateningly. You wretch. Kanal's shout was simultaneous with my own. Dare you bring your blasphemies into this sacred ashram? But master stood protectingly in front of his abuser. Don't get excited over nothing. This man is only doing his rightful duty. The officer, dazed at his varying reception, respectfully offered a word of apology and sped away. Amazing it was to find that a master with such a fiery will could be so calm within. He fitted the Vedic definition of a man of God, softer than the flower, where kindness is concerned, stronger than the thunder, where principles are at stake. There are always those in this world who, in Browning's words, endure no light, being themselves obscure. An outsider occasionally berated Sri Yukteswar for an imaginary grievance. My imperturbable guru listened politely, analyzing himself to see if any shred of truth lay within. The denunciation these scenes would bring to my mind one of master's inimitable observations, some people try to be tall by cutting off the heads of others. The unfailing composure of a saint is impressive beyond any sermon. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. I often reflected that my majestic master could easily have been an emperor or world-shaking warrior had his mind been centered on fame or worldly achievement. He had chosen instead to storm those inner citadels of wrath and egotism whose fall is the height of a man.